is going to be a very powerful message. If you're not accustomed to Pentecostal preaching, I may stomp and snort a little bit, but that's because I preach it the way I feel it, and I feel it the way I preach it. Amen? Okay, Genesis 32. Genesis chapter 32, beginning at verse 22. If you would, I think you're going to be very excited by the message, the word that God has given me for today. If you stand with me today in honor of the reading of God's sacred text, I read today from the New King James Version, Genesis 20, uh, 32, beginning at verse 22 through the end of the chapter. And he arose that night, speaking of Jacob, and took his two wives and his two maidservants and his eleven sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go for the day break. But he, meaning Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to Jacob, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, saying, Tell me your name, I pray thee. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Now, I realize in hearing that, you're thinking, man, that's a confusing pile of words, and I don't know how this preacher's going to get anything out of that. But, oh, wait until you hear what God's got for us today. Would you bow your head? King Jesus I love you so much, and I'm so grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to deliver this wonderful, exciting word that you've placed in my spirit for today. God, I could offer your people nothing in the way of spiritual nourishment or health outside of the anointing of your Holy Ghost and outside of your divine presence resting upon each and every heart that's in this room, each and every heart that will hear this message by faith. Lord, this hour I ask you, God, to set my soul on fire with your divine anointing, that I might deliver it with the fervor, God, that it deserves, that I might deliver it with the urgency that it deserves, God, that it might go forth with the sound of authority and power, that it might work the work in the life of each and every individual that hears this message, whether here or by faith. Master, in the name of Jesus, grant all this we ask, for we ask it in none other name than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. Praise God, amen. If ever there has been a portion of Scripture that always kind of confused me and kind of just didn't quite make a whole lot of sense, it was the story of Jacob wrestling with this man, or in the King James, it tells us that it was an angel. And we know in studying the word that was used in the original Hebrew, that the actual implication here was that this was a theophany, that God had manifested himself for a temporary short span as a man, and that Jacob indeed had met with God face to face. When all this was done, if you remember what I just read, didn't Jacob say, 
He said, I'm going to name this place Peniel for why? For I have seen God face to face. You see, Jacob recognized who his visitor was, not necessarily, uh, he was not there, you know, sometimes people think that every time God comes, he's going to be God. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? If God appears as a man, you wouldn't know any different than to think he was a man. Amen? Why do you think Jesus has such a problem? <laughs> because nobody could see his divinity. All they could see was his humanity. But Jacob saw something that went past this man's humanity. Something else was there that Jacob was kind of curious about. And the Bible tells us that Jacob wrestled with this man until daybreak. Well, my Lord, friend, why in the world did Jacob even bother wrestling with this man? What was the need? What was the reason? What was the purpose? Looking at the situation in context, you understand that Jacob was running from his brother Esau. Jacob had spent his entire life living up to his name as the supplanter. And he had done everything in his power his entire life to get the birthright from his eldest brother Esau and be able to claim that birthright for himself. You see, Esau was the older of two twins. Now, if you, on your first pregnancy, give birth to twins, then your firstborn is which of the twins? The one that comes out first. Right? But you see, as Esau was being born, the Bible says that Jacob's little hand was holding on to his heel so that he could no sooner get out except that Jacob was coming out right on his heel. Haven't you ever heard that phrase, right on his heel? And that's where it comes from. Jacob, from his earliest days, wanted what Esau was going to have, or what Esau was to be promised. God had made a promise to Abraham, which was Jacob's grandfather, that through Abraham all the nations of the world would be blessed, that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, that the number of his family would outnumber the sands of the sea. And Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named, well, firstborn, the next one in line, the one who experienced the promise that God had made would be Esau. How many of your Bibles do you read? That he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. You don't see it, do you? No, no, no. But there's a reason for that. Jacob wanted it. Esau didn't value the promise that God had given to his grandfather, Abraham. Esau didn't value it. He didn't appreciate it. He didn't think nearly as much of it as Jacob did. But Jacob did, and he wanted it. I got news for you. There are a lot of people in church today who think that because they're heterosexual, they've got a right to be there. And they can be saved. And they can be a Christian. And they can sing the songs of Zion. And everything's okay just because of who they are. But honey, you may be the firstborn, but this thing's going to the one who wants it. Hallelujah. We've got governments of the world today that argue and fight and bicker. They may not like one another, but they recognize one another. The United States of America may not like Tony Blair. This isn't a good example, but I'm just using it. But they recognize him as the official representative of the British government, right? But now there are times when the United States of America has to make a decision that a certain government in a certain place is not to be recognized as official 
the official government of that country. And you say, who are you to make that determination? Well, if someone takes over the Philippines by reason of a coup, the United States government may say, no, we still honor the government that was in place before the coup. As far as we're concerned, that's the official government. And we do not recognize you. Did you just hear my phrase today? We do not recognize you. Okay, Brother Martin, I was just saying, what's the deal with recognize? Well, the title of my message today is Fighting for Recognition. Why was Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord throughout the night? The answer is very simple. Jacob had done everything that was necessary to get the birthright and the blessing from his father. He had it in his possession. He had grown out in the world and he had raised a family and he had become very prosperous. He had everything that he ever wanted. But there was one little problem. There was still one person that Jacob had to be recognized by officially as the heir to the promise. And that person was God. You see, Jacob, you might take the wool and you might tie it out to your arms and stand in there before your blind father and pull the wool over his eyes. So he doesn't realize you're not his oldest son, but instead his second son. And he blessed you with the blessing of Abraham. You might be able to pull the wool over old Isaac's blind eyes, but guess what? You can't pull the wool over God's eyes. <laughs> and that's the last fight that Jacob had to fight. He had to wrestle with God to be recognized as the official heir to the promise that God had made to Abraham and Isaac. So that all our Bibles today read Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. Why? Because he wrestled and he prevailed and he won and he got God to recognize him as the rightful heir. Hallelujah. I want you to know children today. I don't care who you are, where you come from, what's your background. I want you to know that the blessings of God's salvation are available to you if you want them. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter who was born first, but this thing will go to the one who wants it. Hallelujah. It will go to the one who values it. It will go to the one who cherishes it. It will go to the one who will fight for it. Hallelujah. And I'm in church this afternoon to fight for my right to serve the living God. And let somebody try and stop me. Hallelujah. Jacob wrestles the angel of the Lord. Bless me, he says. Recognize me. Acknowledge me. We can only acknowledge that which we have first recognized. Governments of the earth sometimes refuse to acknowledge governments of other foreign countries because they do not recognize that government as legitimate. I've got some wonderful news today. My Jesus is a God of the underdog. Jacob was the underdog in the story that we were reading today. He was about to come face to face with his brother Esau, whom he had by hook and by crook, taking the birthright from, he was on the very verge of facing his brother for the first time in many, many years. He sent his family away, as we read in our text today, so that they wouldn't be injured because he knew Esau's going to hate me. Esau's going to want me dead for what I took from him. But you know what? I wanted it bad enough to go after it, and I got it. I don't care if First Assembly got up the street like the idea that we're here or not. Amen. If 
I want it bad enough, I'm going to go after it, hallelujah. I'm going to lay hold on it for the life, and nobody's going to stop me. Praise God. Because God recognizes those who are willing to fight the fight. Amen. You think you put forth the effort to believe God for your salvation? You think you put forth the effort to serve God and live for Him? You think you put forth the effort to go to church and worship the Lord and God is not going to recognize you? I've got news for you. Oh, yes, He did. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, He did. God's the God of the underdog. That's why God appeared that day, not to Esau, but to Jacob. Amen. Why didn't he go to Esau and say, Esau, you've been robbed. Esau, your brother's taken advantage of you. Esau, let me help you. Get your birth right back. No, God said, let me talk with Jacob. That's the boy who loves this first fight. That's the boy who believes in this blessing. That's the man who wants this thing bad enough that he's willing to do whatever it takes to get it. That's the one I want to talk to. <clears throat> I believe the Lord's in church with us today. You know why? Because there's some folks here got the same attitude. Amen. So you know what, Lord? Whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be there by hook or by crook. Let him. I don't care what they got. I don't care what Esau's got to say. I don't care if Esau wants me dead. I don't care what the situation, how bleak it looks or how bad it looks. All I know is I want it bad enough to get in there and fight for it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. God's on the side of the underdog. Jacob was the underdog. He was not the firstborn. One strike against him. He was not the one who most pleased his father. Two strikes against him. He was not the one who by rights would inherit the birthright, the blessing, and the promise of his grandfather Abraham. Three strikes, you're out. Jacob was the underdog. But you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Even the Ark of the Covenant, which God had built up specifically to his specification, which represented the very presence and power of God, brought victory in battle and blessings to those who possessed it. To hear me, to those who possessed it, it didn't matter whether they had gotten it through inheritance or whether they had gotten it in battle. When the Philistines got hold of it, they weren't even God's people. But when they got hold of the Ark of the Covenant, guess what? The blessing came with it. Possessions nine-tenths of the law. Amen. If you value salvation, if you value knowing God, if you value serving the Lord, then honey, fight for your right. Hallelujah. Get in there and get it. Because once you've got it, it's nobody going to take it from you. Hallelujah. Life is not, as they say, for the faint of heart. And another old saying, for I'm just using all these cliches today, to the victors go the spoils. Many times in life it is not the one who deserves something by right who actually attains it. You ever notice that? It's not the person a lot of times who actually deserves it by reason of right who actually gets it, but rather the one who has earned it by seizing it. The guy who works hard all his life to buy a new car and he has a beautiful new car and he puts it in his driveway and the next morning he comes out and guess what? He doesn't have a new car anymore because somebody else has seized it. Even though he deserves that car, he earned that car, he worked for that car, honey, it's not his. Somebody else is driving it. You understand me today? And we say, oh, it's so unfair when that's life. Amen. That's right. That's the way it works. It's not always the one who deserves it by right that gets it, but the one who wants it enough to 
fight for it and seize it. Possession is not traced to the law. Of course, you know the car example. Obviously, you're going to get arrested and thrown in jail. Because don't mean by saying, well, woo -hoo! I'm going to go out in possession, not just for the law, and I'm going to tell the policeman that Brother Marlowe told me I could have this year old. No, don't do that. Jacob valued the blessed position of heir to the promise of God made to his grandfather Abraham. Jacob knew the promise. Jacob even quoted parts of the promise when he prayed that very day that we're reading about today. As his angry brother Esau was headed his way, presumably to kill him, Jacob needed the Lord's help. And to ensure that help, he had to secure the Lord's official recognition of him as the heir to the promise of Abraham. Esau's coming. The only help that I can possibly have right now is from God. And in order for God to help me, he's got to recognize, God, I fought for that birthright. I wanted that blessing. Esau didn't appreciate it as much as I did. He didn't want it as much as I did. And I got it, and it's mine. Hallelujah. Genesis 32, 9 through 12, listen to what Jacob said in his prayer before wrestling with the angel of the Lord. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will dwell well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all of the truth which you have shown your servants. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, quote, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered the multitude. Who really deserved that birthright? Jacob did. Why? Because he valued it and he wanted it. He was willing to work for it. Amen? And you know what else? Listen now. Listen to me. He also knew that it wasn't about him. He said, Lord, I am not worthy of the least of your blessings and your mercy and your truth. You know, when I come into the house of God today, that's the same exact attitude I've got. That's the same thing going on in my head. Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not even worthy of your blessing. I'm not even worthy of your grace. I'm not even worthy of the truth that you've allowed me to know. But you know what? There's one thing I've got going for me that he said I don't have going for him. I want it. Worthy or not, I want it. Hallelujah. That's what we call faith. Because then it's not based on your worthiness. It's based on his grace. You're not trusting in your own grace. You're trusting in his grace. That's what Jacob did. He said, well, it ain't about how good I've been, because Lord knows I haven't been. He said, but I want it. I want to be next in line. I wanted to be the firstborn. I wanted to have that birthright. And I pursued it, and I made it happen. When I get to heaven, I guarantee you, I'm going to stand before King Jesus and say, Lord, I want it. <laughs> I made it happen. I didn't sit back and wait for somebody to hand it to me, and I didn't let anybody tear it out of my hands either. But I wrestled until I got it. Amen. And there's not a devil in hell going to tell me I can't be saved because of who I am. There's not a devil in hell going to tell me I can't know God because I'm not the firstborn. Honey, you can't change the fact that you're not the firstborn. That is an immutable fact. Amen? 
But you're not the firstborn, then there ain't nothing you can do about it to make yourself the firstborn. You can kill the firstborn, and you're still the secondborn. Amen? Well, there are some things in our lives that you cannot change. They are immutable facts. You can do whatever you want to do. You can cut things off and do this and do that. But you know what? You're still going to be you. So rather than trying to be something that you're not, why not approach God for the person that you are? Are you hearing me today? Jacob didn't approach God and tell him a bunch of tales about how good he's been and how wonderful he's been. He said, no, I recognize I'm unworthy, but you know what? I want it. And I need your blessing. Jacob got the blessing. He was recognized by God as the birthright heir because he wanted it badly enough to seize it. His own father Isaac was blind and issued his blessing to the wrong son because he could not see, and Jacob was able to deceive his father, appearing as he saw his fur tied to his arms, so that he would appear to feel as hairy, rugged, masculine Esau. And you can't pull the wool over God's eyes today. If God was to recognize Jacob as the rightful heir to the promise he made to Abraham, Jacob would have to prove he deserved that blessing by seizing it in the wrestling ring. So why did Jacob have that wrestling match that day? He was fighting for recognition. He was fighting for God to recognize him officially as the promise, the heir to the promise he made to Abraham. You're following me. I hope you're following the line of thought that I'm trying to get across here. There was a purpose in that wrestling match. Amen. There's a purpose sometimes in the spiritual fights that we experience and the battles that we experience in our own spirit. Matthew 11 and 12 tells us that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. I want you to know there's a battle raging every moment of every day in the heavens. Heaven itself is under constant attack. That's what Jesus said. That's not the words of the law. That's what Jesus said. If you think you're going to get into this thing by just walking in and tippy toeing in, it don't happen that way. You've got to wrestle your way in. Come on now. You've got to fight your way in. You're going to have to seize it. If you think that once you get saved and once you get the Holy Ghost and once you get baptized in Jesus' name, that the church world out there is all of a sudden going to recognize you for as a child of God and as a believer and as a Christian, wrong. It ain't going to happen. You're going to have some battles to fight. But it doesn't matter because the battle goes to the one with the desire to win. Hallelujah. I'm going to go now, thank First Timothy 6, 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. What is Paul saying? He's saying, boy, you got to want this thing bad enough to seize it. You've got to want it bad enough to lay hold of it and make it a reality in your own life, regardless of who you are, where you come from, or what other people might say or think. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, the Apostle Paul gives us a a list of, of various parts of armor that were to wear as children of God. Why would Paul describe all this armor? Why would he give us all this um, imagery if the people of God are not engaged in a battle, if we're not engaged in a fight? Amen. We are. Cornelius was a man of Gentile heritage. And interestingly enough, Cornelius was a man of war. He was a centurion. None in the early church assumed 
that the Gentiles even had a place in the promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this didn't stop Cornelius from doing right and seeking God, regardless of who he was by reason of his birth. And God sent Peter, hallelujah, to the house of Cornelius to bring him a clear understanding of the full gospel of Jesus Christ, and that gospel included Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, 1 and 2, there was, there was a certain man in Sisera called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave alms to the people, that means charity, he gave away money to help people that were in need, and prayed to God always. See, Cornelius, the soldier brother, he wasn't stupid. He knew if he was going to get it, if he was going to find it, if he was going to have it, that he was going to have to fight for it. He said, well, you know what? I'm out here. I'm a Gentile. I'm not even part of the Jewish people. I'm not even part of Israel's race. But you know what? That's all right. Then I'm going to fear God anyhow. I'm going to give on anyhow. I'm going to pray all the time, and I'm going to read the Scriptures. I'm going to do what i got to do to do what i got to do. And God on earth put in. Because he sent Peter to Cornelius' house to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Cornelius was the first non-Jew to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost ever recorded in Scripture. So you see, it's not about what you're born. It's about what you want. You're following me today, children. I hope so. It's not about who you are by reason of your actual birthright. It's about which birthright you want. That's why this whole thing is called born again. Amen. Because when you're born again, you get out of whatever birthright you're born into in the flesh. You, you jump out of that and jump into a brand new birthright. Amen. As a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm almost done. The Ethiopian eunuch was banned from the temple and the inclusion in the nation of Israel because of his permanent, unchangeable mutilation. Yet, he made his way to Jerusalem to worship. Hmm. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Why did he come to Jerusalem? To go to the nightclub? To visit the bar? No, he had come to worship. This man, by reason of the, the law of the Jews, was not even, he didn't have a hope in hell, so to speak. But he still came to worship. But listen to this. Was returning and sitting in his chariot with Isaiah the prophet. This man traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship in a temple, knowing that he had the hope in hell of being included. Because his body had been mutilated in such a fashion that the law provided nothing for him. The law of God said, sorry, if, 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 you're, an, if you're a eunuch, you cannot be permitted into the fellowship of God's people. But he still came in. Not only did he still come, but brother, he's riding home, and what's he do? He's reading his Bible. There's something to be said for folks that won't let other people tell them that they're hopeless. There's something to be said for folks who won't let other people tell them that they, they, they weren't born right, or that something about them is, is unchangeable, and as such, it makes them hopeless. Who 
are willing to put forth that extra effort to still go to the temple and worship, to still read their Bible. Hallelujah. Or like Cornelius, or who still give their alms and who still pray. Amen. And God sent help to the unit. If you ever one of these who wanted it so bad they were willing to seize it, God sent somebody to them so that they could have it. Amen. Do you hear me today? Praise God. Amen. No matter how Jacob went about attaining the birthright as rightful heir to the promise of Abraham, the bottom line is he had it. Amen. No matter how he got it, he had it. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Now, in our text today, we find he needed the Lord to recognize him as the rightful heir to Abraham's promise. It's not about who we are by reason of our birth, but who we are by reason of our new birth. We say today, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we hear the angel telling Jacob his name shall no more be called Jacob of Israel. And in Scripture we frequently read the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Amen. Even though Esau was by birth order the rightful heir, but Jacob valued that birthright more. And it was he who seized it and made it his own. Galatians 3, 26 through 29, and I'm closing right now. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, listen to this now, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according <laughs> to the promise. It's not a one of us in this room that when you become a child of God, you become a Jacob. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. But honey, if you've got the will to seize it, it's yours. And if anybody tries to tell you any different, I've got news for you. The Apostle Paul let us know in Galatians, once you come into the body of Christ, it's a perfectly level playing field. Amen. Ain't no more black and white. Anything disgusts me more than black church, white church. Amen. I hate black church, white church. I think it's garbage. God's church is God's church. Amen. That's why we sing that chorus today. Bind us together. Bind us together with chords that cannot be broken. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. There's not a male or female. People get worried about transgender, transsexual, so on and so forth. Honey. The kingdom of God is now the male or female, bond or free, Greek, Jew. Come on now. We're on a level playing field. Who cares? Amen. I can let the person next to me be themselves as quick as I can be myself. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It's that easy. You be you, I'll be me. And hopefully, God willing, we'll meet in the rapture. Amen. If you want it today, it's yours for the taking. Don't let anybody tell you you can't be saved. You can be. Amen. And if there's anybody that comes into this fellowship that you want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins according to apostolic fashion, according to the teaching of the New Testament, you let this pastor know. I have a small pool at my complex, right? Very private, very quiet. Nobody hardly ever uses it. I can baptize you night or day. And we baptize in the Pentecostal Apostolic Church the way we do it is this. The minute you decide you want to be baptized, we'll baptize you. It's that easy. Amen. We don't do, you know, hold off for six months so we can have enough people to have a service. That's not the way they did it in Scripture. That's not the way we do it either. 
Amen. And as soon as someone's converted and decided that they want to believe on the Lord and serve Him, we baptize. We'll get you some dry clothes, don't you worry. Amen. But anyway, I want you to know today that they were wrestling for recognition. Many of us today are wrestling for recognition. We're wrestling. We feel like we're wrestling for God to recognize it and say, yes, you are an heir, according to the promise. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? It's the closing prayer. I hope you got something from this message. I did. I, I was excited about it because I never could figure out what in the world they were wrestling about. <laughs> I always thought that was, I uh, never could figure out why they, you know, got into this big wrestle match and said, what? But anyway, I just was really blessed by this word this week and I hope you were too.